All right, and now I'd like to formally introduce all of our uh, panelists for today. Amanda McKenzie from the Academic Integrity Office. And then from the library, we have a team, including Carrie Weaver, Lauren Bill, Victoria Chu, and Jackie Stapleton. Um, the way we're going to proceed through the session is that we'll start with Amanda, and Amanda will give us uh, an overview of academic integrity, um, and then she will pass it along to Carrie and we'll proceed from there. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over control to Amanda and we'll get underway. Thank you, Monica. Now I, I realized I was muted there. Apologies. Um, great to uh, have this opportunity to speak to each of you. Um, just going to show a first slide here. Uh, this is actually a poster that we've used on campus um, in, over the past few years, and I think it's a really good just overview of um, what we mean when we say integrity. Uh, and that is displayed by the number of um, values that are on this um, poster. So really at Waterloo, this is something that we promote um, across all levels. So it's not just student facing that we're expecting students to act with integrity in these values. We expect everyone on campus. So staff, faculty, students, administrators, and we all should demonstrate these values because whatever we role model, we know that students will emulate what we do. So a little bit more about um, that concept, that term academic integrity. I found over the years that many different people have different understandings and different experiences with the term. So just to make sure we have a general understanding, uh, here's a definition of academic integrity. So it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles that you refuse to change. And again, they're really related to six values that were on that first poster that I showed, which are honesty, trust, respect, responsibility, fairness, and courage. And as we know that, um, you know, integrity is again a, a core value that we we link with who we are and we want to make sure that our students as well as ourselves also strive to make the right decisions with everything we're doing not only in our academics but also our, our personal lives as well so i just wanted to, to be clear that academic integrity is sometimes um, thought of as a negative thing if you ask students about it um, sometimes students will react and say oh that's when you get caught for cheating uh, so it sometimes has a negative association, but I really want to be clear that that is actually the academic misconduct part of it, not the academic in integrity part. Academic integrity is really the positive pieces and these values that are displayed on this side or slide and anything that breaks the rules, um, which would involve in a, in a penalty would be an academic misconduct. So I think really we need to try to encourage our students to act with these values wherever we can. And again, if we all model these values, it will help us nurture a culture of academic integrity on campus. So you might want to have um, or you might have some questions about how much academic misconduct really occurs on campuses. So in this slide, um, this is kind of a, a diamond here and at the top you'll see there's sort of the top half are the people that would never cheat. And the bottom half are the people or not half, but portion are the people that would always cheat. And the largest section is in the middle. And this is about 60 to 70 percent of people that may be swayed into engaging in academic misconduct. So this is what we would typically expect um, in a campus environment. And usually uh, misconduct rates are usually around between three to five percent of students a year. So that's actually not a very high rate. We do find that the number of instances of academic misconduct are typically unintentional, and this is due to a lack of information and, tra and training. So uh, spending some extra time on making sure that students really understand your expectations and what academic integrity is can be very helpful. There's also a very small amount of students that actually intentionally set out to cheat. So those again um, are, are less common on campus. So just to put this into perspective as well, that again, I mentioned this was campus on a normal uh, uh, frame of reference. Now we all know during the pandemic that we've had an, a different frame 
and uh, students have been having extra stress and different things that have impacted their uh, learning environment and their engagement with their instructors and their course material. So there has been globally an increase in academic misconduct during the pandemic. However, I think that this will obviously uh, settle out and change back to normal once we're back into um, in campus, on campus and in person training again. So that's just a little bit to give you a frame of reference about what academic misconduct looks like on typical campuses. So you know how academic misconduct is handled at the university. We have policy 71, which is a, entitled a student discipline policy. And in this policy, it lists the academic and non-academic offenses um, that students uh, could engage in. And as a faculty member, you are required to report any instances that you see of academic misconduct, even if they're relatively minor. Um, your associate deans, whether it be your associate dean undergraduate or graduate, um, would be your contact to go to in your faculty. And if you ever have any uh, instances where you're not sure whether this is actually a case that needs um, formal investigation, you can always ask your associate deans for advice. They are very um, open and willing to help guide you. So we don't want you to feel that you're alone with um, academic misconduct cases. There definitely is support out there for you. In this slide, which I think Monica will share the deck um, after the fact, there is a hyperlink to a video here that breaks down policy 71 and just tells you about all the components that are in the policy. It's a bit more friendly um, than obviously reading the policy itself. And sometimes you might want to use this with students if you want to give them a bit of extra information about policy 71. The Office of Academic Integrity also has a specific spot on our website, um, both for students and for instructors in TAs. Uh, and also uh, a whole section that deals with academic misconduct. So if you're ever in doubt with anything academic integrity or academic misconduct related, I would suggest that you visit our website and you should be able to find at least, uh, if not the information there, the point of contact that you can reach out to. And why is this important that we um, flag and, and speak to students about academic misconduct that they might be behaving in? Just so you know, there are um, a few research studies that have shown that uh, students who engage in this behavior in their academics are more likely to engage in this behavior um, once they graduate school, so into their career path and so, so on. So we want to make sure that um, we try to get students to correct their behavior and realize their wrongs and um, uphold the values of integrity while well, we can and still um, mold their minds before they get out there and um, launch into their career. And we know that this is important because it could have dire consequences for society. So we need to really make sure that number one, um, students are abiding by our rules and that they're also graduating with the right competencies and knowledge and skills that uh, we say they have as having a degree from the University of Waterloo. And that's very important to maintain our credibility and our reputation as an institution. A little bit more about what happens with investigations and sanctions. So sometimes people tend to think that the Office of Academic Integrity is actually the, the main conduit that would handle investigations into academic misconduct. And at Waterloo, this is actually done by the associate deans and they have the authority under policy 71. So um, we are actually not the, uh, the ones that have any authority um, to help uh, uh, either an instructor or a student in that case. So we would have to pass that off to the associate deans. And um, we can provide and point information out about processes that are listed in policy 71, and we can point out other supports. For example, there is a uh, student supports uh, through the um, this, it's not the students, it's at the student center. So when we we're back on campus, and I'm sure they have a website part too, there is a supportive group that will, um, that is student led, that will support students if they are in a um, academic misconduct investigation. So we do try and connect you with all the information and resources that you, you could use. So, you know, in policy 71, all of the penalties are scaffolded, determining um, based on the level of severity of the offense. So if something is low level, 
we don't throw the book at students. We try to help them through the instance and give them lots of um, other educational options to inform them of ways that they can improve. And as I mentioned earlier, a number of students when they come and a number of instances of academic misconduct isn't intentional. They actually just didn't know the information. So we do try to take an educative approach to sanctions when it comes to um, student discipline. Now, of course, if they do do larger um, agree grievances with academic misconduct, then the penalties do increase. So at a bare minimum, you would have someone that would lose points off of their um, the assignment uh, as well as off of their grade, their average for the course. And then it raises in severity from there. So sometimes there could be uh, severe cases where a student might be suspended. And obviously there would have to be some um, pretty serious misconduct for them to get to that level. All that is described in policy 71. So again, I encourage you just to make yourself familiar with that, uh, especially if you're going to have teaching assistance, because the teaching assistants will be looking at you to direct them as far as what they should be doing with academic integrity. The Office of Academic Integrity has recently started offering a, um, a training for teaching assistants that's offered every term. So again, if you have a TA that's working with you and they don't seem like they uh, know a lot about ac academic integrity or they could benefit from knowing more, I would encourage you to look into sending them to that uh, to attend that TA workshop. So clearly at Waterloo, again, we don't take a penalty approach. We're really based in a, an educative and learning opportunity. So how do you help students succeed? It's really important that you clearly state your expectations about all the different things that you're going to require of students in your course. So that would be, uh, are they allowed to work together in groups or do you expect them to work independently? What is the citation style that you're going to be using in your courses? And um, if there are different resources that you can point students to about that citation style, that would be optimal. And also the importance of originality. So it's also good to have a conversation with them about intellectual property in your course materials. We do live in an age where students readily share almost everything they receive. So you should um, know that anything you share with them, they're going to probably turn around and share outwardly with someone else unless you tell them that they are not allowed to. So this is part of helping them succeed by letting them know what your expectations are at the beginning of the term. It doesn't hurt to remind them as you're going through uh, an assignment or a test basis in case your expectations change. For example, you might allow group work in an assignment but uh, for example, completing a test, you might not allow group work, which commonly you would not. So it's always good to reinforce your expectations with students and make it very clear um, what, what they are allowed and not allowed to do. And again, just checking their understanding about the academic rules. I think sometimes we assume that these things have been covered in their high school or wherever they went to school before they arrive. And especially we assume that graduate students are also well versed in scholarship and, and the academic rules they should follow. But this isn't always true. So it's very important to kind of take the temperature of your students in your course, see what they do know and what they don't know, and then you can kind of fill in the gaps and that can really help avoid any um, instances of misconduct and any misunderstandings going forward. We do have a number of resources at Waterloo. We're pretty lucky. Um, again, we have the Writing and Communication Center, which offers a whole bunch of workshops for students on um, paraphrase, paraphrasing, summarizing, um, helping them brush up on their writing skills. The Student Success Office also offers different workshops on um, time management and resiliency, so that's very important. And of course, also accessing counseling in case students are in, involved in, um, you know, ha have some struggles going on. It's important that they know where they can get help. And the Center for Academic Policy Support was the one that I was mentioning earlier that is student um, led and they are the ones that would uh, support students if they were going through an investigation into academic misconduct. So it's it's nice to know that students do have someone that they can um, uh, ask questions about and support them if they are being looked at for an academic misconduct investigation. So a couple ways I'll just cover about ways that you can support academic integrity remotely. 
because I'm sure there will still be um, many of us that are working remotely or doing remote offerings for the next little while. So it's really important that you engage your students. If your students know that you care, that is going to be the greatest deterrent to academic integrity or academic misconduct, I should say, that you could possibly offer. So if they feel connected with you, uh, they feel like they understand the content and the goals of the course and the meaning of your assignments, they'll be way less apt to um, engage in any academic misconduct. We know that if students feel disconnected, they, they don't really understand what's expected of them, they don't value the content, or they're not understanding how it relates to the course, then they're more apt to mm, engage in cheating and other academic misconduct behaviors. So the engagement piece is really key and whatever way you can do that in your own style as uh, as we're engaging remotely um, is obviously up to you, but the more that you're able to do that in whatever way works uh, the best. And of course, I think they appreciate the human side of seeing instructors as as a human being rather than someone who's very distant and and is the instructor. So um, giving some balancing between the, the relationship goes a long way to uh, help them feel included and less likely to cheat. And of course, you can also, again, direct them to the sources that we've listed um, with the Writing and Communication Center. The library is going to go into offerings that they have and the Student Success Office. So on my final slide here, I just want to point out again all the different resources that we have on the Office of Academic Integrity website. We've tried to um, break the website down into three key areas. So there are instructors and TAs information, student information, and there's information for staff. And they kind of revolve around these topics um, on the right of the slide here. So we talk about group work, referencing and research skills, stress and time management, advice and tutoring, intellectual property and copyright, the two uh, text matching software platforms that we use at Waterloo, which could help uncover plagiarism, which are Turnitin and Authenticate, and as well as a section on academic misconduct. Some other offers or resources that we have uh, is an undergraduate academic integrity tutorial. For undergraduates, we have this open access tutorial, which we've just launched and put on our website, and any student can access it right actually through this link. So when you get the slides, feel free to check that out. Um, now, it doesn't do any tracking, but it uh, guides students through the six values that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation um, that relate to integrity, and it gives them different examples of how they would apply that as a student. So whether it be um, some study habits, some um, working remotely, padding the resume for a co-op position, um, really useful stuff. So I would highly recommend that you point your students in that direction um, if you're so inclined. We also do lots of um, office hours and we can do custom talks. The Academic Integrity Coordinator, Erin Nearing, um, does many talks at the beginning of each term uh, that she's invited to do for either specific groups or in different courses. So if that's something you're interested in, our office can definitely uh, support that. We also have promotional um, items. We usually give out post-it notes that direct students to our website. We also have buttons and bandanas and usually some other different giveaways that sometimes we can bring that into class uh, for you, which helps um, grab the attention of your students. And last, we use library ambassadors, which are a great asset for us. We used to train and have our own uh, academic integrity ambassadors, but that got quite uh, quite uh, unyielding over time to manage it. And then when the library started their uh, ambassadors program, we were um, able to tap into that where we buy some of their time to promote academic integrity to students. So it's a great relationship being that these students are already in the library, well-versed and um, have some background training on academic integrity too. So those folks have been very helpful and they also help us promote different academic integrity events on campus throughout the year. So that is it for me. I will let Carrie and her team take over. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's all yours, Carrie. All right. So. 
Thank you. Um, again, I'm Carrie Weaver. I'm the learning, teaching, and instructional design librarian at the University of Waterloo Library. Um, I am joined today by um, Lauren Bile, who you will hear from uh, in a few minutes, our copyright and licensing librarian, um, and also Jackie Stapleton, who's a liaison librarian um, for applied health science, specifically kinesiology, and um, Victoria Chu, who is our um, associate university librarian for learning research and user services. And Lauren and I will speak just a little bit today, and then when we get to the end, we'll have time for Q&A with all of us, including Amanda, um, and we have some questions um, we can talk about and we we'd love your questions and involvement too. Um, so in the library, um, we really like to say that the library has two purposes um, that we are at the center of learning and research. And so we hope to make it easier for you to accomplish your research and teaching goal through all of our collections and our expertise and team of library professionals. So at the library, each subject has its own designated liaison librarian like Jackie, um, who is the first point of contact for what the library has to offer. And this includes in-depth research support for all stages of the research process from helping to formulate a research question or methods to advice managing research data, um, publishing recommendations, um, and advice for satisfying the tri-agency open access requirements as well. So we also provide specialized um, research support for projects like systematic and scoping reviews. Um, and we also do a lot to support teaching, whether this is coming in for a guest lecture in a class or more in an embedded capacity where a subject librarian provides collaborative teaching support throughout a term. Um, we've worked and adapted um, for online instructional realities um, over the last year, and we actually provide a, a great deal of high quality asynchronous um, um, online materials as well that we make available through um, our online learning object repository at the library, which is public facing. So um, what we do aligns with the campus's strategic plan, um, looking to educate global citizens for the future of work and learning to thrive in the age of rapid change by putting learners at the center of everything that we do. And part of the reason that we think it's very important that the library engage with learning is because there really isn't a career path or a future plan that your students may have that doesn't involve interacting with reading, synthesizing, understanding, and ultimately communicating information. Now, what that information looks like and where that information comes from is going to be different depending on the field, um, but it's an extremely complex information landscape that our students are moving into and that we're all working in. And libraries and librarians really are at the center of that. So, what do we teach? Um, well, we we often teach something that we'll call critical appraisal or critical evaluation of information, or sometimes in our field, we call it information literacy. Um, but it's really a combination of things like finding information, um, evaluating the information that's found, and um, ideas and techniques around using information or integrating information into the work that you do or that your students are doing. Um, so we provide teaching supports across um, the range of the undergraduate, graduate, and research or scholarly experience. So um, at the undergraduate level, this can include things like helping students just figure out if the information they're working with is relevant or uh, applies to the research project that they're working on. Um, 
It can be finding academic or distinguishing between academic materials. It can be really specific. Um, things like patent searching comes up, uh, especially in the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem at the University of Waterloo. Um, at the graduate level, um, we're often working much more in depth, so it can be specific methods, it can be really specialized information. Um, Jackie, who's with us today, works with a lot of students on that systematic review issue. Um, it can be something as simple as really narrowing down and helping to formulate a really good high quality research question um, that is useful and, and researchable in some way. Um, so at the research level for you as a scholar joining our community, um, we also provide research data management solutions. We have two librarians who specialize in RDM. Um, and we we often engage with and provide support across librarians for um, review projects that you might be working on as well and collaborate um, as part of those. So it really runs the gamut. And um, the biggest thing is really to have a conversation with your liaison librarian about what you need. Um, but I would also say, uh, just like Amanda was talking about um, a little bit earlier, don't make an assumption that your students come to the academic environment um, really prepared to engage in research tasks. Um, the expectations that have been set for them and, and how they've been used to doing this often um, can be at odds with what your expectations are here in the university environment and in the more formalized academic environment. Um, and so it's it's really important to think about that and think about how to offer students support and to be explicit about what you are looking for and what your expectations are around um, around research. So I'm going to let Lauren take over speaking um, and I'm going to just turn my camera off um, and she's going to speak a little bit about copyright and intellectual property. Thanks, Carrie. OK, so uh, I'll just speak about uh, a couple different elements of copyright. Um, so mainly your rights uh, about copyright when you're teaching and your responsibilities. So first up, uh, your rights, which are mainly covered under policy 73, intellectual property. Um, Amanda was talking a bit about them earlier and about uh, having those conversations with students. And it really all ties back to the fact that you own the material that you create uh, for teaching and research activities. Um, and uh, that means that uh, students might need your permission to reuse that content, especially in more open environments. Um, while uh, exceptions are still available to them, generally it's best if uh, you create a, a conversation um, that helps them understand what you're expecting of them in terms of sharing your IP. In terms of policy 73, um, while it is fairly lengthy, it is really quite informative. So I would suggest that you give it at least a skim over. Um, but uh, the two main components of it that I think are the most important in terms of teaching are highlighted on this slide. Um, the first we've already mentioned that you own the content you create. And the second being that the university uh, has the right to make uh, use of that content um, for internal purposes. So usually I like to think about this this is keeping the operations of teaching and learning uh, going, um, uh, even if uh, circumstances exist where you can't be the one who delivers the content. Um, so these are kinds of things that are in policy, but the practice of them looks quite different. Um, so it's usually common um, uh, at, when you're teaching that uh, common courtesy dictates that we don't just use other people's material even though the university has rights um, to use them um, on creation. The important exception for policy 73 is uh, the assigned tasks bit. Um, sorry, Carrie. <laughs> uh, it's the assigned tasks bit um, and uh, assigned tasks include things like uh, course outlines or syllabus. Uh, creation. Um, so just keep that in mind that the university does own certain content um, like course outlines. Next slide, please. 
So uh, as Amanda was mentioning, it's important to have a conversation with students at the beginning of the term about your expectations um, with regard to the things that you own. It's also important to let your students know that you use third party materials in your class. Almost all, all courses use some kind of third party materials and that use of both yours and third party materials outside the classroom might have consequences for them in terms of an academic misconduct or for the university in terms of a copyright infringement suit. Uh, there is some boilerplate language that I've linked here um, that uh, both uh, legal and academic integrity folks have come up with to help you communicate the basic understandings about IP in your course materials. And uh, if you find your content on third party platforms like Course Hero, uh, you can always uh, use the takedown forms that they provide on their sites on your own. Um, but Legal and Immigration Services has also offered their help in the past for uh, moving you through those uh, cases where you'd like your materials removed from a specific site and you're having difficulty. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of your responsibilities, um, basically we want to make sure that we're using legal copies and that they are used either under a Copyright Act exception like fair dealing, a library license, or with the copyright owner's permission. Um, so we want to be sure that we're using materials legally and that we um, are using them uh, under the requirements of the Copyright Act. And sometimes this takes time. Um, you want to make sure you're going through your materials and assessing them um, or using a service that will do that on your behalf. Um, so I do have an example of this just to give you a sense of um, what this might look like if you were to do it on your own. So say you wanted to use uh, chapters six and seven from Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Um, you may be familiar with the fair dealing uh, advisory or the fair dealing guidelines that allow for use to of one chapter or up to 10%. Um, but chapters six and seven amount to 15%. And so you would need to ask permission in order to use this content in your class. Um, so what I have here is a screenshot of the Copyright Clearance Center, which is a service that would allow you to ask for permission for the, those two chapters. Um, and the screenshot's a little bit um, blurry, um, but uh, what you can see there is that we're asking for uh, 36 pages and the quoted price is 363.50 US dollars in order to use that with 50 students. Um, so obviously that price goes up and down based on the number of pages and the number of students in your class. Um, but if you did this on your own in order to upload it and learn, this is something you would need to figure out how to cover that cost um, in order to use those two chapters of content. So what we would normally suggest in these kind of situations is to go through library course reserves. Um, the course reserve staff will go through your list of content that you want to use, evaluate it as to whether it fits under fair dealing, a library license, or whether they need to ask permission, and they'll cover the permissions costs um, on your behalf. Um, so with at no cost to you or the students, as long as those uh, costs are generally fairly reasonable. Um, so always uh, better to have folks uh, do this on your behalf, um, just time-wise, and because these folks work through copyright clearance all the time, it's a bit easier for us to handle. Um, uh, the other thing to note is that not all things are available through the Copyright Clearance Center, um, and that requests that require reaching out directly to the publisher or the author often take quite a bit longer than the relatively automated process that happens uh, through the Copyright Clearance Center, and you might need to budget a, a few weeks for those requests. That applies also to library course reserves, so getting uh, preparing um, and uh, getting your requests in as soon as you can is uh, always appreciated. That's really all I have to say about copyright. There are lots of services and resources um, available to you. In particular, uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to copyright at uwaterloo.ca. That reaches uh, me and other copyright folks on campus. So uh, it's the best way to, to get uh, advice on that, um, making sure that you're not hitting someone who's on vacation. Um, there's also a bunch of resources listed there in terms of the copyright guidance that's available on our 
our website, uh, an author's rights guide for those of you who are publishing, um, and information on library licenses. And um, one thing I wanted to point out um, that I will have added to this slide before we send it out to you um, is that as of today there is a uh, copyright course available under the self-registration page uh, in LEARN and it covers uh, the full gamut of things you would need to know uh, about copyright for your teaching as well as some uh, copyright information for you as an author. Um, so definitely check that out if you want uh, some more in-depth information. Thanks. Well, many thanks to all of our panelists for sharing this important information and for doing so in such a digestible fashion. Uh, for all of our attendees, I do want to confirm, as Amanda said earlier, that we will be sharing all of these slides in their PDF format, so you'll have access to all this information going forward, as well as all the links out, all the additional uh, peripheral information that supports this primary digestion. So at this time, what we're going to do is open up the floor uh, for questions from the audience, and we're going to have uh, our speakers, so Lauren Bile, um, Amanda McKenzie, and Carrie Weaver, along with Jackie Stapleton and Victoria Shu, available here to answer those questions. So then at this time, um, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> at this time, we're going to ask that you feel free to share your question by either typing it into the chat or by raising your hand. And I see that there is a hand already available. So I am going to look and see who that hand belongs to. And it is Ayman. So Ayman, please feel free to come on camera and, and uh, tell us your question. Uh, first, thank you very much for this uh, very invaluable information. It was very interesting uh, to know all these things. Uh, I have one question for Amanda and one question for Lauren. OK, so Please. start with Amanda first. Uh, I, I had uh, a case last term. Uh, I have a sus high suspicion that one of the students, it was an online exam, uh, was cheating. And the reason I, I believe that because I was teaching them a uh, uh, course for non-major students and he used very advanced techniques that we only teach it for specialized students. Uh, so I, I have very high suspicions. I did what you, you suggested. I contacted the associate dean. They investigated and the students simply said, I read that on my own. And that's it. So it, it was it was over. So honestly, uh, I was discouraged uh, to pursue this further in the future because as far as we are in online, it is impossible, I think, in my opinion, to prove anything unless the students admit that. Otherwise, there is no way. So what's your uh, intake on this? What is your uh, comment suggestions about this case? Yeah, unfortunately, I think your experience has been um, a common one with a number of, of faculty members um, across all institutions that have been offering courses and, and trying to do assignments and tests in a remote environment. It's really difficult to try and get evidence about these things that have taken place. Um, sometimes there is some um, uh, metadata behind the system that could be tapped into that might give you an idea um, that could be used in a case that could solidify some some misbehavior by students. But you're absolutely right. It's it's very difficult to to prove um, in a remote setting. So I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge. Unfortunately, I don't have any easy answer. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of work specifically by people in uh, CTE to help instructors look at their assessments um, and tests and look at other ways that they can um, perhaps uh, make it higher level learning in Bloom's taxonomy and less um, rote memory type questions. Uh, in, in the STEM field, again, it's very difficult to change your assessments, so I, I understand the struggles. Um, all I can say is please don't give up. Um, <laughs> it is important that at least at least I would imagine that that student might got the little bit of heads up that, oh, even even if maybe he was dishonest and didn't use his own work, even though he said he did, uh, at least he knows that you're paying attention. He knows that you um, did report it or were looking at that. And I think that that goes to show that integrity is important and we, we do um, expect our students to maintain it and we will explore 
and investigate where we can into instances of misconduct. So please, please stay positive. No, I know. I, I, I think I think the point. last point, the, the last point is a good point, is that when the students see that we, even if it ends up with nothing, at least they know that we are watching. So Absolutely. I think I think that's I think this is a good it's a very, very valid point. It's a very powerful thing. I mean, if we don't do anything about it and we ignore it, then students take that as being complicit that it's OK. okay. And we don't want that. We want them to know that uh, it's not appropriate for them to engage in um, academic misconduct and cheating. So uh, appreciate you doing that and I hope your experiences as you go forward will be better. Oh, Thank you very much. Uh, Lauren, I have two small questions for you. Now, uh, uh, my course as usual, I have PowerPoint presentations. Sometimes I found a nice illustration in the internet that I like to add it. So I sometimes I take it as it is with the link from where I got it. And sometimes I edit it. I just do some changes, move, remove. And when I do that, I feel that there is no need to put the link. So in both cases, what do you think? OK, so there's a there's a couple pieces there. So um, when I was talking about responsibilities, the first one is to make sure that you're using a legal copy. So in order to um, use content, use third party content, we need to be starting with a legal copy. Sometimes that's difficult to verify when we start with materials that are posted online, um, and that's something we can help with. But assuming that you are using a legal copy, um, say uh, an image posted on uh, somebody's personal website that they've taken themselves. Um, there's an exception in the Copyright Act that allows you to use content um, found on freely available websites without asking permission as long as you're doing it you know for your specific course um, and that it's only available to people um, that are registered for the class so you're sort of covered there um, what you're talking about in terms of adaptation um, adaptation is a right provided to copyright owners so they have the right to allow or dis allow adaptation. You can use Copyright Act exceptions to do that, but it doesn't lessen the responsibility to the author for their moral rights, which is the right to be associated with the work. So what I would suggest in terms of citation, um, and I always suggest uh, to instructors to use the citation style that they would like their students to use if they were presenting um, or submitting an assignment. So it, that can vary in terms of um, your comfort level, um, but generally the author name, um, and then if you have adapted, you can say adapted from, um, so that people have an idea of what you've done. Um, use a very brief statement about changes made is sometimes helpful, um, just so that folks know that it's not the original. Does that help? Yeah, Hello. Okay. thank you. Thank you. Carrie, I see you have your hand up. Please jump yeah. on it. Well, I was just going to to jump in with with things related to both questions, actually. Um, so one is just to say that um, Amanda and I, along with uh, somebody from the Student Success Office, have actually been working on a grant to create some um, academic integrity training materials specifically for undergraduate STEM students. And those aren't available yet, um, but they would be, well, we have to get them done by February. So um, so they'll be, be coming pretty soon. Um, and um, it is hard in the online environment, but I, I also think training and, and being explicit about what you're looking for is important. Um, the second thing, something that I got into the habit of as an instructor and, and recommend um, would be searching through Creative Commons licensed images, um, where the Creative Commons license actually tells you what you can do or can you adapt those images and so forth. It gives you more information about what the permissions are. Um, and I, I have generally, as as 
on the teaching side when I'm instructing, um, found that to be a really useful way to get at, you know, I'd like to jazz up my slides in some manner, um, but I want to make sure, thanks Lauren, um, I want to make sure that that I'm using things properly and crediting them properly. So I, I found that to be really helpful um, as a way to approach that. Thanks very much, Carrie. Um, and, and just before we move along, I did want to add maybe a wee bit. Amanda had alluded to the fact that uh, the Center for Teaching Excellence does offer some suggestions around how you can pose questions, whether in an assessment or an assignment, that reach higher in that Bloom's taxonomy in terms of the level of learning that you're hoping for for your students. And, and one of the ways that is, is really useful, just to give a concrete example, is to, to um, this is for you, Eamon, to, uh, coming back to your question, is to have students present two examples. They choose the examples and you encourage them to select them from different contexts. And then they do a comparison of the two examples and how they relate to a concept or how they relate to a certain context, what, however you position the question. And that kind of compare and contrast situation can really suit many disciplines and really does force a certain amount of originality and a certain amount of, of um, ownership on the student's ideas to be presented, as opposed to it being a translating or a transferring from some other primary source. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation as well. Um, others, are there other, ex oh, Jackie, Jackie, please, you have a, uh, something you'd like to add. I do actually, and it's actually more a question for Lauren, <laughs> just to clarify for, for myself. So one of the most common questions that I get from um, faculty and instructors is that question about, um, can I use uh, this image figure uh, table from a textbook or say a published journal article? So I just wanted you to clarify your earlier statement about being able to use um, that material within um, a class instruction um, and if there's any difference when you're distributing that in slides to the class. Sure, so what I what I was hearing there is um, there's a distinction between um, the, the question from before where the image was found online um, and the content that someone might find in a uh, textbook or journal article. Um, so there's a specific exception in the Copyright Act, uh, section 30.04, which is called work available through the internet. That puts all of those works grouped in one chunk um, and the content needs to be freely available basically. When you're getting content from a textbook, um, assuming that textbook is in print, we sort of go back to the fair dealing exception, which looks at the amount you can include being up to 10% of the work. Um, so there's some availability there, but a little bit less freedom than folks, uh, than works that are posted freely to the internet. When it comes to journal articles, um, they're usually under a library license, which says what you can and can't do with the content. Almost all of our licenses allow for some version of inclusion of the material into teaching. Um, there are so few that that wouldn't, it would be, it doesn't really merit much uh, mention of them. Um, and you can always ask questions about that if you're um, concerned about using materials from journals um, to copyright at UWaterloo. Um, does, that, does that help? Is there things that we didn't cover there? It does. I'm not sure if, if my memory is, is Remember, to me, that's maybe old, but I always thought there was a difference between um, using an image um, or a table or, or a figure in a slide that you're presenting to the class and then um, different rules for distributing the PowerPoint slides to the class, um, like mm. through an email or that type of thing. Is there a difference or, or you don't have to worry about that type of distribution? As long as the distribution is to just the students in the class um there it, it to me this it's kind of six of one half a dozen of the other the the students who would be sitting in person watching the the lecture there there's still 
the copying action isn't quite the same. There's a little, there's a more permanent copying happening when you're distributing it. Um, but as long, the fair dealing advisory for the fair dealing components does say that as long as it's restricted to the members of the class, um, that it's fine. So if you're posting those slides to learn or a password protected website or something along those lines, then it would be okay. As long as you're not posting them to the open web or some other unrestricted access point. Um, and then similarly for the work available through the internet, one of the requirements is um, that it's only available to students in the class. So it's that limited distribution piece that's key. OK, thank you. That clarifies it for me. Thanks, Jackie. Good questions. Thank you both for expanding on that. We do have another query coming from uh, Pez Wuhan. So please, if you'd like to step forward uh, virtually and share your question, that'd be monster. I'm just going to stop sharing the presentation though here. I don't think we need that anymore. So we can see faces on the screen. That'd be great. Sure. First of all, thanks for all the great presentations. It was very informative. My question is actually a combination of a couple of smaller questions centered around the same thing. Um, I'm curious about the platforms that we have as instructors to automatically check the reports for plagiarism. I know, for example, about uh, Turnitin or Authenticate. And for those, my maybe I'm not very familiar uh, with the whole implementation process. Please correct me if I'm um, miscommunicating something. But typically, you need to integrate that with the you know submission module in Learn, for example. That's how I figured out. Is there any other um, tools that instructors can use for occasional basis? For example, when you're reviewing reports as TAs or instructors, you come across, you know, with, you know, to reports or writings that you raises your eyebrows and say, oh, maybe this is suspicious. And you want to check that one specifically, not the whole thing. Especially in my cases in senior courses, I try to establish sort of a relationship and be transparent about the rules and everything. I don't want to force my students to submit through an integrated module. It, it, it doesn't like uh, feel comfortable to me. I was wondering if there is any platform that I can use, you know, for occasional users or checking. That's my first question, actually. I can respond to that. Um, unfortunately, no, there isn't another platform <laughs> that's readily available. Um, that said, I know people will do Google searches of cut and paste into Google, so you're welcome to, to use that. So what I think I hear you saying is that um, this might be student material that's not in a learn format that you come across that you're not sure if there's been some um, plagiarism involved in that. I would encourage you that um, you can take that material and request that your associate dean run it through Turnitin for you. Um, and, and that's OK because that's under their uh, authority with policy 71. So again, if you do have something that's suspect, but again, it, it didn't come into you through a, a learn course, um, you can you can ask your associate dean to run it through for you, and that's completely legitimate. So you do have that option uh, as well as Google. Thank you. Yes, it, actually, that's the way I typically do. I copy paste it in Google. It's not the most convenient way of doing that, but I agree. And no, my question was specifically about the reports, for example. I have a Dropbox set in Learn for them to submit, but typically, you know, maybe in some, even in many cases, it's not um, an intentional misconduct. We went through the graduate studies and everything, and we know how to paraphrase or even a sentence you need to put quotations on and so on and so forth. But I was wondering if uh, there is a platform, but thanks for your uh, clarification. And the second uh, part was, actually about it, your experience with those two uh, existing platforms. Have you noticed any downsides? For example, I can share one example from my time at Penn State when I was working there. Uh, we used to check the comprehensive exam essay responses there with one of the tools. And there was a tricky, you know, portion aspect to using that platform. And when a student uh, used uh, this tool once, for example, he was 90% ready to submit his final work. So it used to be collected in the database. And the second time that you, as the reviewer, run the same writing into the database, it was detecting overlaps or you know plagiarism. However, when we went back, we traced it you know, to the root. It was the same submission from the same student, and there was no trace. Have you observed anything like that that we need to be aware of or any 
maybe glitches? I can answer that a little bit. Um, I've had experience with both tools, but not so much as an instructor standpoint, but more kind of behind the scenes and from the field of academic integrity. I think what you're saying, uh, the way we use Authenticate at our institution is that um, the students and the researchers are given their own account. So sometimes if they have uh, previous copies that they haven't deleted out, then that gets compared against and then there's that flag. So that's a bit of a pain. So um, we do encourage people to like get rid of older versions that they have in the system um, or else uh, it will compare against it and flag it even though it's it's still the same work, right? So it's not really a, a, a true instance of, of plagiarism. Other than that, I, mean, I don't have a, a, a lot of um, bad things to say about them. At Waterloo, I think we really try to encourage people to use Turnitin as a way to give students the practice with um, citations. So you can set a, a draft schedule up so students can submit drafts where they'll see where their errors were and then they can correct them. So I think that's a nice way to gently get students up to speed with citation skills. Um, again, you, sh you, sh you do have to do a bit of training to, to know the settings in Turnitin and Authenticate um, and also to have pretty uh, reasonable expectations. So I did have a student a number of years ago come to me and say that their instructor had uh, put in a cap that they wouldn't allow anything above a 5% match. Yes, I mean, that's that's just really unreasonable, right? Like uh, so you need to use the software um, uh, responsibly and be trained about uh, what it's good at and what it's not so great at. So we can also work with CTE to provide custom sessions to help people understand the tool a little bit better and with their settings. Now you're probably well beyond that because you've obviously used it at another institution. But for anyone else on the call who's maybe not so familiar with the software, we can definitely help um, help them get up to speed about, uh, you know, what software you use. For example, Turnitin, like you mentioned, is built in to learn and there's a Dropbox for courses. But um, Authenticate is like a separate account and we usually use that for researchers and graduate students to self log in and they have control over their own um, running of their material. So. Thanks, Amanda. Perfect. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Amanda, I wonder if I could uh, ask you just to extend that a wee bit. I was very curious if you could speak to um, how instructors could collaborate against um, submissions that might be submitted to more than one course. So how could uh, two instructors check that the same submission wasn't submitted for credit in two separate courses? If you could say a bit about that. That's a good question. <laughs> Um, because I haven't used it so much from the instructional side, um, I don't often get involved in that. Um, Sean Warren is our support person in IST that uh, sets up the accounts in both Turnitin and Authenticate and could probably tell you exactly the comparison that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, I think what we can technically do that if I think thoroughly about it, um, because the copies would be saved in our repository but we would need someone with admin status who could compare those copies um, from different courses. So again, uh, if, if instructors had questions like that, they could reach out to Sean Warren. Um, his contact information is under the Turnitin and Authenticate portion of the Office of Academic Integrity website. Um, and also, again, your associate dean is also another conduit there that could help assist you um, with investigating that. Thanks so much, Amanda. That's terrific. Yeah, just knowing the right person to go to in many of these questions is like, really, that's the answer. So awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to go once more back to our, our attendees and just make sure everyone is having an opportunity to submit any questions or comments they may have. Perhaps it's not a question per se, but a clarification of something that was shared. Anything you'd like to know more about, please don't be bashful. Um, let us know. And maybe while folks are thinking that over, uh, I'm going to pose a more general question to all of our panelists. Uh, and, and this one is more along the lines of preventative measures. As we all know, really, that's that's the optimal way to go about dealing with many of these matters that may arise. And all of you have suggested, of course, modeling best practice, which which is excellent all around, whether it's modeling discipline practice or academic integrity, copyright, what have you. All of those things are, are masterful. 
Um, what other recommendations, just really nice, simple things that can be incorporated into coursework and instruction would you recommend? And anyone can jump in and say a word or two or more. <laughs> Please, Amanda, go ahead. I like that, a real hand. I love the real hand. <laughs> real hands. Um, keeping it real. And I, I think that's really kind of the premise of what I was going to say is, is keeping it real, is uh, the approachability of the instructor and again, having um, that relationship with the students, uh, any of that is so helpful for them, especially in the remote environment. Um, students tend to fall off the rails a bit when they have, they feel disconnected and they can't resource or get the support they need from an instructor. So um, again, making sure you're having um, office hours regularly or uh, you know, uh, being available. Um, and, and again, having that human touch with with students, if they see that they might insult you or disrespect you as a human being by cheating in your course, that is your best measure of protection to help be proactive to promote integrity in your in your course. So like, it all goes back to that kind of human connection for me. Thank you for circling back to that, Amanda. Yes, thank you. I can definitely see that as being so important. And for those of you in the audience that attended our first session of Who Are Our Learners, we spoke at some length about connections within a course and, and the importance of the instructor to student connection, as well as peer to peer connection and of course, peer to TA. So uh, it, all, it all comes together in terms of supporting the best uh, learning environment. So thank you for that, Amanda. I see Lauren, you're in the picture. Please jump on in. Sure, yeah. I think uh, one of the things we always like to say is to, to start as early as you can. I know that's not always possible. Um, but then if you're using uh, course reserves and you can't start early, just have patience with the process. We really do try very hard to make sure that the things that you want to make available are made available legally. And sometimes that just takes a little bit of extra time. Um, so thinking about those things that you might want to include um, as early as possible and getting those requests in. But then also um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, it, as we're, especially as we're transitioning to hybrid uh, in the fall, is that the copyright concerns for um, online and those for in-person are pretty similar actually. Um, so there's not really necessarily to have way a whole bunch of change in the way that you assess things. Um, uh, other than audiovisual material. Um, and I won't get into that right now, but if you want to use a AV material, send us an email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. A and Carrie, please, I see you on screen as well. So please share. Yeah. So I, I think um, from my perspective as an instructor, the biggest thing that you can do is that you're in control of the learner or whatever learning management environment that you're in and your students would like to have as much available to them in that environment as possible. So when we're talking about the supports, for instance, at the library, we offer at this point very extensive chat services. Um, I believe we're nine to nine Monday through Friday and noon to nine on the weekends on Saturday and Sunday. So it's very extensive and that's a fantastic resource for students who are just like, I, I have a question. I need an answer as soon as possible. I'm not sure who to go to. Even if we're not the right people to go to, we can usually track down the information for students. But a student isn't necessarily going to go to the library website and think, oh, the library will have chat services unless that's something that you have told them and provided a link to within Learn or whatever system you're using to deliver your course. So from my perspective, one of the, the things that I can sort of tell you on behalf of students um, is that they would appreciate if you would make as much available to them in that environment as possible. So as you're looking at setting up your courses, thinking about, thinking strategically about what you want to include there and how you're going to do that and how you're going to lay out and present that information, I think is a really important thing to do. And your, um, 
not library liaison, but your liaison at the CTE. Um, every faculty has a, a liaison at the Center for Teaching Excellence, and those folks are fabulous and fantastic resources for helping you think about how to set that up, um, whether that ends up being part of the syllabus or that ends up being kind of a help page within your content or whatever that is. I think that's really one of the best recommendations that I could give is make it easy. Um, awesome, Carrie, and thank you for the little, um, you know, recommendation to go to your CT liaison because on that bridge, I'm going to add to that response and say, all of these wonderful suggestions from Amanda, Lauren and Carrie are, are things you want to start doing early in the student's academic career. So what I would really emphasize, and you're going to hear more about it in our blended course design workshop we're concluding tomorrow, is spending time in the early years in your course on these sort of metacognitive pieces, in effect, is what this is about. It's learning how to learn, learning how to be successful in academic environments. Give it time, like make sure you actually embed time in your course to to attend to many of these needs that your students will have. It's a part of that the responsibility to the learner as a as a holistic individual as opposed to just within your discipline. And so it's something really to make sure you set time aside. It can't be an add on. It has to be an embedded within. So thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Carrie. Really appreciate it. And I see we have a hand raised, so please, I see that it is. Hugh, could you please uh, feel free to turn on your camera and, and let us know what your question is? Yeah, so thank you for all the, all the talks. It was very interesting. Uh, so I have a question about uh, the usage of preprints. Uh, so many articles and also uh, sometimes book authors, uh, they post uh, preprints or postprints of their articles or books. Uh, for example, in the course that I'm uh, teaching in fall, uh, there's one of the textbooks that actually has a freely available uh, preprint uh, online. And I was wondering what are the policies about using materials from preprints uh, or postprints? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, a lot of the preprints, um, uh, usually preprints, depending on the policy of the journal, are still copyright of the author. Depending on where they're uploaded, the repository or website may give the author an option to assign a Creative Commons license, which would be a really clear indication of what you could or couldn't do. Um, but usually my experience with these things are is that preprints are generally an open way to make these things available. Um, and so usually you can link to them. Linking um, to legally available material is always OK. Um, so uh, I would just recommend that you link to the content um, in your course. Um, if it has a Creative Commons license, you could upload it to learn or it could be uploaded to course reserves. Um, but otherwise, unless there's a statement, it's all rights reserved, which means you would need to go through the process of assessing under fair dealing or some other exception whether you could use it. Um, with linking, you don't have to do that. Um, so it just helps avoid having to go through that clearance process. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and uh, once again, just going to go back to our attendees, see if there are any additional questions that have come up for you, anything else you'd like to inquire about. And as you're giving it thought, I want to make sure I offer an opportunity for all of our panelists to just add anything that they've been thinking about as questions have been raised and we've been discussing specific uh, inquiries. If there's anything more they want to add to the conversation. Or if you just want to turn your screen on and say hello, that's cool too. <laughs> So if, if there's nothing more that folks would like to add, I, I'm we're totally fine to finish here. Um, of course, you have your resources, as we mentioned, in the PDFs from the slides, which will be going out um, tomorrow. I can assure you they'll be sent out tomorrow. And if after that, after you've had a chance to digest it a bit more, maybe look through all those resources, you have additional questions, 
please don't hesitate to ask any one of our panelists. I'm sure any one of them would be very happy to answer any questions you may have, uh, and if, including myself, even though I wasn't contributing as a panelist. If you have any queries for the Center for Teaching Excellence, please don't hesitate to send them my way. Uh, but I'd like to thank all of our panelists officially for all their contributions and thank you to our attendees for your questions. This is really the reason we are gathered here is to attend to the things that you want to know and to answer the questions that you have. Um, I see there is some typing, so I am going to wait just in case there is a question coming from that chat. It's a thank you. OK, that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very brilliant. We're thank going you. to close here and have a best the best of afternoons. Take care, everyone. Bye.